Hey everyone and welcome back to our next video in the series about atoms and their structures. And today we're actually going to get into how to draw these things. Uh, previously we were talking a lot about the atom. We know that matter is anything that takes up space and has mass. Uh, we've realized that all matter is made up of these atoms. And atoms ultimately being the building blocks of matter they're kind of really like what you build anything out of. So they're, they're kind of like the bricks that make up a house, if you want to think in those terms. Ultimately, inside the atom, we have protons, neutrons, and electrons. The protons are positive. Uh, they're often represented by some sort of plus sign. So immediately I look at this image, and I see that there's these yellow pluses. That's got to be the protons. Looks like there's two, four, six, seven of them. Uh, the neutrons, in this case, would be the orange balls with no symbols on them. And those tiny little thing, gray balls with the, the negative sign, that would be the electrons. Notice again that we're trying to show both that there's a size difference. We're showing charges. There's a lot going on in this that you might not be picking up. So, so really pay attention to those tiny details. Uh, ultimately, the protons and the neutrons are found inside the center of the atom. That place is called the nucleus. All the electrons are orbiting around that nucleus and various energy levels. So the guy that we're going to be working off of is Niels Bohr, and he has what's called the Bohr model. And the Bohr model of the atom is it, it's simplistic, but it's very correct. Okay, So it's not as complicated and it's involved as what you might have heard of as like the wave theories and all these kinds of things and quantum mechanics. Uh, but it does, it, it is an early level of that sort of thinking that is very, very useful. So Niels Bohr was actually a, a Danish physicist uh, from back in the day. He made huge contributions to atomic structure and quantum theory. This is a very fundamental quantum theory kind of thing that we're looking at with his 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 particular model. Now, he received a Nobel Prize in physics back in 1922. So this is, we're talking about 100 years ago that we started figuring this stuff out. Ultimately, the Bohr atom, the Bohr model is saying that atoms exist in discrete energy levels, and they orbit around the nucleus, but sometimes they might jump from one orbit to another. And we don't go too much into the jumps. A lot of those jumping things are caused, uh, are caused by the absorption of energy and the emission of that energy. Because realistically, the electrons want to be in that ground state. They want to be in the lowest electron energies possible. And that's how we're going to draw them. We're going to draw them in what's called ground state. That lowest energy where everyone is as packed as close to the nucleus as possible is the image that we're going to make of all the atoms that we're going to be working with here. Ultimately, Bohr's model has been replaced by the wave model, uh, but those foundational concepts that he laid out were correct. And um, ultimately, the wave model verified his calculations for the energy levels of the hydrogen atom within the Bohr model, which shows you the validity of what Bohr really did. He, he was very, very brilliant and insightful. Uh, so it's it's pretty cool to actually work with what he did. Now, within a Bohr model, what you do is you start by drawing the nucleus. Okay, The nucleus is where you're going to put all the protons and the neutrons, obviously. Now, you can just put a number and a P for the protons. You can put a number and N for neutrons, and everyone's going to understand you. Okay. Uh, sometimes I'll put P positives. Uh, oftentimes when I do that, I put ends with a zero uh, to show that they have no charge. Uh, it's, you know, an extra step. And honestly, chemists are lazy. We're not going to want to take those extra steps necessarily. Uh, so a, a capital P and a capital N will totally suffice for uh, drawing a simple Bohr model. Okay. Later on, you might be working with something like, I don't know, Scratch and making more complicated models, in which case you might want to show the positives and things like that. But for right now, just focus on a P and an N and you're okay. Uh, ultimately, you got to write down the numbers of the protons and the neutrons inside the nucleus, and then you draw the first energy level. Okay. 
Once you draw the first energy level, you populate it with up to two electrons, and then you move on to the next energy level. Okay? You populate that with some electrons, and if you have more, you go on to the next energy level. Okay? Once you've ran out of electrons, then you're done. Okay? So obviously we need to sort out some things here. We need to sort out protons and neutrons and electrons and have those numbers available. But once we have those numbers available, it's a pretty straightforward process to actually create these models. Okay. Now, the thing about the energy levels that you want to remember is ultimately the first level can only hold two electrons. Okay. The second level can actually hold eight. And that eight is really important because uh, that eight is like the the, the key number as we're going to go forward. Uh, level three can hold 18, but we really care about the uppermost eight because by level three, you actually have uh, different energy levels within a single level. It's like kind of like a, a tiered set of in, in energy level three. So the outermost eight are really the most important ones when we talk about some of the, the bonding type stuffs. And the same thing happens with level four, is that you have, can hold 32 electrons, which is huge, but it's really that upper eight that we really care about. So sometimes we'll say 288 is what we're really worried about, uh, especially if uh, we look at the Lewis dot diagrams, which can be sometimes useful. Uh, when we're doing uh, molecular bonding, you'll probably see those. We often focus on that outer eight. Um, but just know that uh, ultimately two, eight, and 18 are really where we're going to spend the most time with. I, I don't go too far past the third energy level when we're actually working with these kinds of models in class. The most important rule as far as energy levels go is that you can't jump up before you filled it okay so the first energy level has to be filled with its two electrons and then you move on to the second that second level has to be filled with its eight electrons before you move on to the third energy level okay that's really really key to what we're doing here so ultimately we got to figure out these protons neutrons and electrons before we can go any further right we have no clue how to actually get that information to draw these things. Once you have that information, it's super easy. Okay, so the place we got to go to find all that is the periodic table of elements. Uh, you're going to mostly use a periodic table in this class to find uh, the symbols on here and figure out what the symbol is telling you that the model looks like, because this is actually packed with information, and a lot of these uh, periodic tables have even more information than just the stuff I'm going to show you today. Uh, there's a lot of stuff you can get out of here, like what kind of um, valence electrons I'd be looking at, or is this a metal or a semi-metal or a transition metal? Like what's going on inside can be really easily gleamed from um, just understanding the periodic table and, and how things are arranged. So the most important piece uh, within it for us today is if we looked at an elemental symbol here, uh, you usually see a number up on top, you see some sort of symbol, like usually it's one or two letters. The first letter is always capitalized. That's really important. Uh, it's really important because chlorine, Cl, looks a lot like carbon and iodine. Car C and I. That's a common mistake that kids make uh, when they're first working with these. So it's always a capital letter and then a lowercase letter. So look for lowercase letters. Uh, lowercase L looks like a capital I sometimes if it doesn't have the, the top and bottom drawn. So this is one of those places in life where you got to be a little careful with how you write stuffs. And then at the bottom, you have a much bigger number. And that bigger number is atomic mass. In the last video, we talked about that, the atomic mass being an averaging of all these isotopes. So that atomic mass is never going to be a nice, clean number for you. Even here with helium, it's 4.003. Okay? Oftentimes, we just work with it as a 4 in this process that we're about to show you. So the first thing is, and you may recall this from last video, is that the atomic number is the number of protons. 
Okay, so here I have an atomic number of two. That is the number of protons inside helium. The number of neutrons, on the other hand, I got to come down and look at the atomic mass. If I subtract the atomic number off the atomic mass and round so that it's a nice even number, I'll find the number of neutrons in the most common isotope. So in this case, uh, 4 minus 2 would give me two neutrons for a helium atom. Lastly, the, the number of electrons is equal to the number of protons, okay? Because we're not drawing ions yet. We're not talking about what where things go with ions. And even with ions, ultimately, you would start with protons equal electrons, okay? Protons equal electrons, and then you would make some modifications for ions, either gain or lose electrons. We'll talk about how that works uh, probably next week. So let's try doing some of these problems here. So we need to figure out the protons, neutrons, and electrons. And our first thing that we're going to be looking at here is lithium. Okay. So I look at the symbol and I see that there's a big three. That's the atomic number for lithium. That means that there's three protons and there's three electrons. Okay. So we can start off by putting some threes in there. Now I need to figure out my neutrons. I've got a messy atomic mass, of course, at 6.941. Most atomic masses are messy. I'm going to call that 7. Okay. 7 minus 3, minusing the atomic number from the atomic mass, gives me 4. So there's 4 neutrons inside a lithium atom. Well, how many energy shells would this have? All right, the first shell holds 2. I've got one electron left, so that one electron is going to go into the second energy level. That means that I've got 2 orbits that I need to draw here for this. Okay, So I'm going to start by drawing my nucleus. There's three protons, there's four neutrons inside that nucleus. Okay, Three and four. Now I'm going to put a circle around it, that's my first orbit. I'm going to place my first two electrons. But I've got one more electron left. Okay, So I can draw my second orbit, I put that next electron in there, and I'm done. Notice I'm spacing the electrons out around the orbit. Okay, Giving them even spacing here. How many valence electrons would this have? If I look at the outermost shell, that's that second level in this case, that's my valence shell for lithium, and that valence shell is holding one electron. There you go. You've now made a model of lithium. So let's try the next atom here. Our next atom we're going to look at is carbon. Okay. Again, I start with the atomic number. Atomic number in this case is six. That gives me six protons, six electrons, right out the bat. 12.011 is my atomic mass. Uh, so I'm just going to make that a 12, subtract off six, and I get six neutrons. So this is one of those times where the protons, neutrons, and electrons are all equal. Neutrons uh, can vary, but it's usually really close to the number of protons. Okay, You don't often see it get too different, especially in these lower elements, right? Um, so how many energy shells would this have? I'd have two. I'd have two electrons in the first shell. I'd have four electrons in that second shell. And now we draw the, the, the model. So I got six protons and six neutrons in the center. I'm going to put a circle around that. That's my first orbit. I put my two electrons in that first orbit. Then I draw my second orbit. Now I've got four electrons left to place. I'm going to place them evenly around the circle. And there you go. Model of carbon done. Okay. And now I can ask my last question of what, what's up in the valence? There are four electrons in the valence shell. That valence shell in this case is the second orbit. So I'm going to say that there's four valence shells in that particular section. Problem three here, I got neon. So now we're getting a little bit bigger. Neon is a noble gas. I again look at the atomic number. Atomic number is 10. 10 protons, 10 electrons. Okay. Now my atomic mass is again a messy number, 20.180. Okay. So I'm going to say that that's 20. Right. I'm going to subtract the 10 off of the 20. And I said there's 10 neutrons. So again, we got a situation where 
protons, neutrons, and electrons are all the same for this one. That is not always the case, as we saw with our first example of lithium, where we had three protons and four neutrons. Okay, So keep that in mind that this will happen, especially in smaller atoms. Uh, but ultimately, neutrons does not have to equal protons and electrons. And in fact, when we get into isotope drawing, we're going to even go deeper in, and you'll have multiple answers for each atom. So how many shells does this thing have? Uh, well, the first shell holds two. The second shell can hold eight. I've got ten. And two plus eight is ten, so it's going to still be two energy shells. The bolt started out with the nucleus. Ten protons, ten neutrons in the nucleus. I draw my first energy ring. Uh, first shell has two electrons, of course, in it. That second shell can hold up to eight. And I fit all eight in it, because that's the max. And that is my ten electrons all put into place. That means that the valence shell for a neon atom has an eight. And that actually is, is special. We call that the octet rule. Um, if you have eight in your valence shell, then you're likely to be very stable and not really interested in reacting. Uh, in fact, we call those the noble gases. We'll get into that in a bit uh, down the line. But ultimately, things like neon, argon, uh, xenon, they all have this full octet valence shell situation wherein ultimately they're, they're not interested in this bonding game that a lot of the other atoms are going to participate in. A lot of that chemistry and interactions between the elements really comes from the valence shell. Okay, so let's do one last one here. Uh, I got a big one for us. I got sulfur. Okay, same situation. Notice how some of these uh, symbols have changed a little bit. Like this one has the atomic number to the side. Uh, previously, we were seeing it pretty much centered over the S. This one also says that S is sulfur. Okay, there's a lot of little variants that happen within. Uh, the symbols, so you got to be ready to adapt depending upon what sort of uh, periodic table you're using and what sort of uh, way of showing things. And in fact, some of them will even put more and more information in. So I've got a 16 for my atomic number. Down on the bottom, I got an atomic mass of 32.066. I'm going to call that 32. Okay. All right, so 16 there tells me there's 16 protons, 16 electrons. Now I got to figure out my neutrons. Well, 32 minus 16 is going to give me 16 neutrons for this most abundant element, most abundant isotope of the element. So how many energy shells does this have? Okay, well, the first can hold two. The second can hold eight. That's 10. I've got six left over, and all those would fit into the third. So this is going to have three. Okay. How many valence shells? Well, let's figure out this out. Let's let's draw it here. So I got 16 protons and 16 neutrons inside the nucleus. I'm gonna put my first shell. I'm gonna put two electrons around that. First shell's now full. I draw my second shell. Second shell can hold eight. I place eight more around it. That's 10 electrons down, but I still got six left. So I draw a third shell. And I start placing those evenly around the circle. And then suddenly, I've got all 16 electrons placed. This element's got six electrons in its valence shell. Six electrons that would really interact with others to do the bonding piece. The rest of those are pretty much out of that game. Uh, and realistically, that, that's making models. Okay. Uh, there's going to be more to this. We can talk about isotopes. We're going to talk about ions. We're going to talk about other little pieces. But for right now, uh, practice drawing elements uh, pretty much up to uh, the 18th one. Uh, so argon would be probably about as far as you want to go uh, with drawing these Bohr models. They get very messy very quickly, as you've probably noticed, uh, if you're trying to draw these on your paper. Um, and we're going to ultimately be using these in our studies uh, to make models 
and we're probably going to be making those models inside Scratch. Uh, so we'll talk about that more down the road, uh, but for right now, give this a practice and see if you can can work them. Okay, see if you can draw elements from like hydrogen through argon and how that looks. And ultimately, that skill is going to serve you real well. Uh, and chemistry and, and all the stuff we're going to be studying here for a bit. So I will talk to you more later. Uh, have a great week and bye.